true crime review, an unflinching gaze into the depths of human depravity. The podcast covers current crime news, updates on cold cases and resources for research and investigation. True Crime Review often discusses disturbing and violent crimes, so listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Episode 9 of True Crime Review. We're going to start off this episode with a few shout outs these are reviews from itunes so if you want to see if you can have something read on a future show please go leave an itunes review that would be awesome um unlike some other shows and this is not a dig on anybody but unlike some other shows i i don't only read five star reviews It would be great if I only read five-star reviews because that's the only amount of stars I ever got. But that's not... So far, that's not happening, which is fine. But I'll read, you know, I read any good review, which I take as not just saying that I'm I'm doing really well, but uh, whether it's, you know, complimenting or telling me how to to fix something or improve something. So first shout-out goes to RevBomb0Z7. He says, I love this podcast. Quote, so informative and loving the emergency calls being added in at times. It gives a real insight to each story, and I look forward to each episode being uploaded. Keep up the great work. So thanks for that, RevBomb0Z7. The emergency audio, I did skip at least one episode that probably should have been emergency audio, but that's because I really want to wait until I get both the right source material together and the time to edit it together uh, properly because sometimes it requires a little bit of censoring or or other stuff so that will be uh, the next episode episode 10 should be an emergency audio episode and just a, a warning ahead of time it may be a little more difficult to listen to than even our last one okay the next shout out goes to rebexter 13 just gets better quote it's a new podcast the first few episodes are not as good amen rebexter i can't even listen to them anymore but even so everyone improves a lot of stuff that isn't covered on other podcasts so even if you listen to 100 others this is a must add xoxo and RevExter13 is not exaggerating because in case you haven't heard or seen me on social media, there are well over a hundred uh, different true crime podcasts. Okay, not episodes, podcasts. Um, most of them, though not all of them, most of them are still publishing every week or every other week or every month. So you can go to truecrimereview.net slash the dash list and check all those out. That's a list that I constantly update, and you're going to find something you like there, even if you end up not liking uh, this podcast. All right, Blue Jeep says, wonderful true crime podcast. Love the host and the content. What I don't love, the creepy intro. Sorry. That was Blue Jeep saying sorry to me. Uh, You know, I wasn't sure about the creepy intro. But I think that the creepy intro is going to stick around. You know, some of the stuff that we talk about is really creepy. You know, it's really disturbing. And, you know, my voice is pretty, I would say, average. I I hope it's not too disturbing. You know, it's not exactly overly joyful or anything either. Um, So I think a creepy intro voice like that gives a good warning as to how creepy and disturbing things might, might get in any given episode. So... Uh, that's gonna stick around. I think we're gonna we're gonna hang on to the the creepy voice. All right, last shout out goes to Haley Bailey ninety three, and pretty sure this is Haley from Curiosity Kills. And I'm reading this because I like the review, and you'll see why. "Quote: I'm a huge fan of this podcast. Joe finds the best stories to talk about." 
He isn't discussing the same story every other podcast has discussed. He's going to the depths of the internet, page two and so on, to find great stories for his listeners. Also, and I did not pay her for this or ask her to do this. Also, Joe is a great writer. He's so eloquent with his words. The True Crime Review is to die for. All around great podcast I'm proud to be a subscriber of. Keep up the great work. TLDR, Joe writes real good. That's several E's. Finds unique stories, great podcast, must listen. Um, so there you go. I couldn't have written it better myself. And it kind of sounds like I did write it, but I promise you I didn't. So thanks, Haley. Go listen to Curiosity Kills if you haven't already uh, started subscribing to them. Great podcast. Um, and they'll come up a little bit later. Although not as uh, the weekly or episodic recommendation of another podcast to listen. Okay, moving on to updates. So the murder of Gordon Semple. You may recall in previous episodes that I discussed the arrest of Stefano Brizzi in uh, the UK, who uh, is alleged to, well, not alleged, he, I believe he's already convicted, and that's the update, uh, convicted of murdering Gordon Semple, whom he met on Grinder, the dating app, and he dismembered Gordon Semple. He attempted to uh, dissolve him in acid in Brizzi's bathtub, uh, the evidence was pretty overwhelming. In fact, he didn't he didn't deny just like dismembering him and trying to dissolve him and trying to get rid of the body. He kept denying that he killed him. He said that he died after failing to uh, say a safe word that they were supposed to be using during during some kind of sex game that they were doing that involved domination and I, I guess choking or something. And so he alleges that Gordon Semple, uh, you know, failed to use the safe word and subsequently died, either of suffocation or a heart attack or something. There was really no way for the authorities to determine the exact cause of death because, again, he, you know, he, he chopped Mr. Semple up. He tried to dissolve him. What little they did find of the body was mainly in Mr. Brizzi's kitchen, and there was pretty significant evidence that he tried to eat various parts of Mr. Semple, uh, which to me pretty much discounts the whole idea that, that he killed him by accident. Anyway, he was convicted, and I'll follow that. I'm not sure where sentencing is going to go for that, but I will definitely be back with that. This Beatsy guy is a maniac, so I'm really glad that he was caught. I'm really glad that he was convicted. And, you know, Gordon Semple's family is, as you can imagine, going through a lot. I did read a statement from, I believe, his brother in a previous episode, so you can go and find that at truecrimereview.net. And, you know, my heart just goes out to him. He was, he had a partner, I believe, uh, a romantic partner. I think he lived with the guy. And it's just, um, you know, it's unimaginable. So we're going to go now to an update on... The Sean Great case. This was the first emergency audio case I did, um, and it may be one of the first cases I did in episode one. A woman escaped after calling 911 after Sean Great fell asleep. She escaped from him. Uh, he had abducted her and was basically holding her hostage at a squad house that he was he was staying at. And he subsequently confessed to at least three murders, and I think he suspected, if he hasn't already confessed, uh, of committing two more. And most recently, remains that were found at another property tied to Great were identified as Candace Cunningham. And this is going to be a quote that I'm going to read out of the Mansfield News Journal. Quote, Prosecutor Bambi Couch Page previously said Great confessed to killing Cunningham in June at the vacant Madison Township house, which was destroyed by a suspicious fire on June 20th or 21st. Cunningham's body was recovered at the rear of the house in a wooded area down a ravine. In the Ashland case, the bodies of Stacy Stanley, 43, 
and Elizabeth Griffith, 29, were recovered in an abandoned house at 363 Covert Court near the downtown. Preliminary autopsy reports indicate both women were strangled. Sean Great has also been implicated in the death of Rebecca Lisi and that of Marion County Jane Doe, whose body was found in 2007 and who has not yet uh, ever been identified. In another update in this case, uh, some tasteless asshole, for lack of a of a more appropriate phrase, although I think it's pretty appropriate, was advertising several items apparently obtained from Sean Great online for sale. And I don't have a name, but this person was in the running for the Human Garbage of the Week. They did not they did not take the title this week. That was that went to somebody else that we'll talk about later. And I just want to point out here that I don't really I don't support murder bilia sales uh, unless there's an asterisk there unless the seller is donating all the proceeds less their costs and stuff to the victim's family or a victim advocacy organization or some other worthy cause. Um, to profit from selling items related to a murder or a murder to me is among the very depths of human depravity that I was thinking about when coming up with this show's tagline. So um, there'll be a link to the article about that in the show notes. Apparently Great was sending stuff from jail. Some of the stuff came from jail to this uh, seller. So, um, there's since been a gag order placed on the case because Great was, you know, sending stuff out of jail and talking to reporters, as you can read about in prior episodes and listen to, uh, you know, some of those stories, uh, in prior episodes. All right, moving on to the news. Welcome back to the Mountain Morning Show. We're doing yoga now. I am joined by Allie and Ann Dado. They are with Twin Power Yoga here in Park City. This is for our Keep It PC segment, celebrating local businesses right here in the Park City area. How are you ladies this morning? Awesome. Thank Good. you so much for having us on the segment. Sure. For Keep it PC. I am so happy to have you guys here because I need some help when it comes to yoga. Just a little bit. I've done some classes, so I'm excited to have you guys share some poses with us. And I'm going to be the, the demonstrator, if you will. We'll do that later later on in the segment but to begin with let's talk about what got, got you ladies into yoga in the first place and clearly you're twins and this is a, a joint passion that you have right it Absolutely. is and it's interesting it's called twin power yoga mm -hmm. but the reason why it's called twin power yoga it's not just because we're twins mm -hmm. it is part of it but it's because we cater to the physical and the spiritual so a lot of times when you come to yoga people have a certain definition of what yoga is it's just a stretch you know and yoga is like a restaurant hmm. it's like going to different flavors so you have to practice at different places to find your flavor we cater to the spiritual and we'll kick your butt and it is <laughs> physical murder charges were recently refiled against a hawaii woman in her twins suv cliff plunge death this is in may quote alexandria was driving a ford explorer this is alexandria duval who also I think goes by Anna Dudal, although I'm not sure which is which as far as first names. But Alexandria was driving a Ford Explorer on Hannah Highway on May 29th with her sister Anastasia in the passenger seat when the SV crashed into a rock wall and plunged about 200 feet onto a rocky shoreline during what was described by witnesses as a hair-pulling fight over the steering, the steering wheel. Alexandria was injured but her sister Anastasia was killed. Though authorities arrested and charged Alexandria with second-degree murder shortly after she was released uh, from the hospital, a judge later ordered those charges to be dropped due to a lack of probable cause. A grand jury, probably convened shortly after her release, indicted her in late October on a second-degree murder charge. Again, when police caught up to her in New York, she fled briefly before being arrested. New York authorities are in the process of extraditing her to Hawaii for prosecution. So what at first seemed like kind of a, frankly, a strange arrest, it's hard to believe somebody would 
do something like that, risk killing themselves to try to kill their sibling, their twin. You know, while initially that sounded weird to me, it's it's really not as far fetched as it might seem at first. Um, apparently, these twins were extremely close, closer than even most twins. They were engaged in extreme rivalry. Apparently, much of their, at least their adult lives. And they had owned two failed yoga studios and had fled from, I think, California to Hawaii, sort of to escape those, you know, that, those two failures. Um, and possibly deaths associated with them. I don't know. We will see now that these charges are refiled what, what evidence the grand jury saw because they must have seen something that convinced them they could take this case back to the judge and say, turns out we, you know, there is probable cause to charge her and here it is. So that could be interesting. We will, we'll keep an eye on that, but certainly a strange, very strange case. The next case we are going to talk about is another real tragedy. This is the deaths of Kirsten Fritsch, Brianna Pavlicek, and their mother, Cynthia Morris. Family members of the victims were too broken up to speak, but tonight one of their neighbors is devastated. Great neighbors. Very quiet, kept to themselves. Victoria Winger now lives next to an empty house. We were all hoping and praying for the best, and unfortunately that's not what happened. Police say what happened was brutal. The body of 16-year-old Kirsten Fritsch found murdered in these woods near Texas City Bar hours after police arrested her boyfriend Jesse Dobbs at that bar. The 21-year-old had been considered a person of interest following the murders of Kirsten's mom and younger sister, who were found shot to death Tuesday in inside their Baytown home. An Amber Alert had been issued for Kirsten, which prompted a massive search. We were very hopeful that we were going to be able to find Kirsten alive. Unfortunately, that proved not to be the case. Police believe all three murders are connected, and they now consider Dobbs their prime suspect. They say he's not cooperating. Dobbs and Fritch were said to have met online. He moved in with her family just a few weeks ago. Authorities issued an Amber Alert for Kirsten Fritch after they found her younger sister, Brianna, and their mother, Cynthia, dead with gunshot wounds in the family's home. Investigators arrested Fritch's boyfriend, 21-year-old Jesse Dobbs, shortly afterward. He's so far been charged, as of this recording, with one count of murder for Kirsten's death, but is being questioned about the other deaths, uh, the deaths of her mother and her sister. He'll, He'll likely be charged in those as well. Cron.com reported Thursday that court documents state Dobbs, quote, stabbed her more than 50 times in a brutal triple slaying and told detectives he killed not the real Kirsten, but the fake Kirsten. Okay, so I I don't know if this guy's had a chance to talk to a lawyer yet. I don't know how smart he is or dumb he is. Um, But this really sounds like the kind of thing where if he is not putting on an act here again you know there's a likelihood of some kind of an insanity defense cropping up um, or at least bringing it up at sentencing as some kind of a mitigating factor i don't know but i'm just going to read that one more time because that's what i like to do when things are super weird Uh, he stabbed her more than 50 times he told detectives he killed not the real kirsten but the fake kirsten and this sounds like a combination of mental illness and, and narcissism. I mean, I assume the fake Kirsten was the one who didn't want to be with him anymore um, or thought he was um, mistreating her, right? Or thought that, you know, maybe he shouldn't have killed her family. You know, maybe that's the fake Kirsten in his mind. And the real Kirsten, you know, that was the one who, who wouldn't have minded any of that. I'm getting worked up. We're moving on. The murder of Sabrina Matthews. It's been eight years since 14-year-old Sabrina Matthews was found sitting on her bedroom floor with her throat brutally slashed. A week before the anniversary, cold case detective John Roberts told the girl's mom they finally had a suspect. Rashawn Venable, now 24, is the murder suspect. In 2008, he was 16 and living in Queens Village, the town next to Cambria Heights. 
Venable's DNA, given to Pennsylvania police in a different case, matched evidence taken from Sabrina's murder scene. Turns out a year after Sabrina's murder, Venable was arrested in Pennsylvania, charged with raping another 14-year-old girl. On November 9th, 2008, someone slit 14-year-old Sabrina Matthews' throat in her queen's bedroom. The next day, at about 1.15 p.m., her father had to find her body. And because there were no signs of forced entry, her father was briefly considered a suspect in his own daughter's murder. However, after he was cleared, for almost eight years, Sabrina's family mourned her murder without a name or a face on which to blame it. That's why Sabrina's mom shared I was so grateful to cold case detectives John Roberts and Phil Panzarella when they told her recently that they had used DNA evidence to arrest and charge 24-year-old Rashawn Venable, a Pennsylvania inmate, already serving time on a plea deal for the 2009 rape of another 14-year-old girl. Venable was 16 years old when he murdered Sabrina, who again was 14. He has waived extradition and been charged with Sabrina's second-degree murder. And the victim's mother, talking about the meeting in which detectives told her that they had found her daughter's killer, said to reporters, I scream out in the ear, and I said, Thank you, Lord! Thank you, Jesus! Oh, God! And I cry, and I cry, and I said, Detective, it's for real? I said, Can I give you a hug, sir? I don't know if I can hug you. They did hug, and there's really nothing that I can even add to that. And now we move on to the human garbage of the week. And this is the murder of Sherry Holland. Now, I work with a lot of mental health professionals, and I know that it plays a far more important role in crime, and particularly violent crimes, than most news reports will discuss. And while I think maybe there are some mental health issues involved in this case, I do think that it is an exception. I don't think that it is the main driver of the facts of this case. So so here are the facts. Sherry Holland was the single mother of a 14-year-old son named Derek when her abusive ex-boyfriend Stephen Frederick Spears murdered her. She was only 34 years old. The Atlanta Journal-Constitution reported Spears had not one, but four, unique plans for murdering Sherry. These were electrocution in the shower, fatal beating, shooting her, and suffocation. In the end, he chose suffocation. And this is a quote from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Quote, around 10 p.m. on August 24, 2001, Stephen Spears hid in the closet of Holland's son's room, who was spending the weekend with his father. Around four hours later, he came out and killed her. Spears choked Holland until she was unconscious, then smothered her by wrapping duct tape around her face and her mouth, placing a plastic bag over her head, and sealing the bag with duct tape. He then apparently, despite it being 90 degrees outside, turned the heat up all the way in her house, probably to accelerate decomposition. When Sherry failed to pick up Derek from his father's house the next day, the two men went to the house where Sherry lived because they were worried about her. They didn't enter the bedroom because Spears had padlocked it shortly after the murder before leaving, and that was probably for the best because... Sheriff's deputies asked Derek to wait outside with his father while they searched the house for his mother. This prevented Derek from being present when authorities discovered what must have been a very disturbing death scene. Spears hid in the woods like the coward he was for ten days before turning himself in. Quote, Once caught, Spears readily confessed to the murder. He told investigators 10 days after killing Holland, 10 days during which he'd hidden in the woods, that he had warned Holland that if he ever found out she was with somebody else, he'd, quote, choke her to death. He told investigators, quote, if I had to do it again, I'd do it. He was tried, convicted, and sentenced to death. 
He appealed, or his lawyers appealed, up to the state Supreme Court. And they lost that appeal. And he was then evaluated for psychological fitness upon refusing to pursue further appeals of his death sentence. And when asked during that evaluation if he wanted to die, he answered, quote, Not really, but would you want to live in a six-by-nine cell? That's not living. I want to die because I don't want to live like I'm living. It's like a cancer eating me up every day, unquote. Sometimes the death penalty widely considered the greatest price for a killer to pay is actually an early release of sorts, preferable to a life sentence. And as an attorney, I sometimes wonder whether prosecutors or even victims' families should be given the option to petition for the commutation of a death sentence to a life sentence. After all, if the killer's statements suggest life in prison would be worse to them than death, I think it should be an option of the victim's families to ask a court to impose the sentence which would inflict the most suffering. The death penalty sentences around the country are obviously not intended to lead to rehabilitation, right? The only purpose of the death penalty is retribution, to cause the killer suffering. If that suffering would be greater alive than dead, it's a reasonable thing for a family to request. I know what you're thinking, you're thinking, I don't want to pay for these people to spend life in prison, even if they are suffering. And, you know, that's a reasonable first reaction, but but I submit to you that the truth is Spears is really an exception, and most killers on death row will fight the sentence quite literally until their final hours alive. And that process can take, and often does take, decades. So you're going to be paying for these people either way. In conclusion, Sherry Holland's killer may have had mental health issues, but his behavior and his statements, as reported by the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and other news outlets, strongly suggest that he killed out of deliberate evil. He planned, and he waited, and he hid, which suggests he thought about it, was willing to risk getting caught, hiding in the closet waiting for her, and knew what he did was wrong, which is why he ran and hid in the woods afterward. Now, while he may have been suffering from one or more disorders, his murder of Sherry Holland was cold, and it was calculated. And that's why Stephen Spears, who was the eighth execution in Georgia this year, having been injected and put to death, is the human garbage of the week. And he's going to be the human garbage of not just last week, but the week or two before when I hadn't released a new episode. So he's going to have us covered all the way back to episode eight, because he's that much of a piece of human garbage. Okay, moving on. Podcast recommendation. This week's podcast recommendation is True Crime Historian. This podcast, and indeed it's a whole website, uh, by Richard O. Jones, features his inspired readings, and I do mean that. Um, I am no reader (laughs) compared to Mr. Jones. Uh, It features his inspired readings of primary source documents, usually newspaper articles from centuries past. Uh, From the Old West to the death penalty to witch trials, Jones is a great dramatic reader, and when you couple that with the excellent production quality and the clockwork publishing consistency, True Crime Historian is one of the great role models for those of us who run solo podcasts. You can subscribe to True Crime Historian at iTunes, Audio Boom, SoundCloud, and just about everywhere else, and you can visit the website at truecrimehistorian.com. The episode 9 resource is going to be a book called The Science of Evil on Empathy and the Origins of Cruelty. This is a book by Simon Baron Cohen, and before you bother to go Google it, he is related to Sasha. He is Sasha Baron Cohen's cousin. Uh, Simon Baron Cohen is a professor of developmental 
Psychopathology in the Departments of Experimental Psychology and Psychiatry at the University of Cambridge. He is the author of The Essential Difference and Mind Blindness and lives in Cambridge, England. So, the the science of evil is... I'm about halfway through the book right now. But it's a really... Uh, this isn't really meant uh, to be pejorative. It's a really easy read. Um, he writes very well for a, a lay audience. It's clear that he... You know, this is not like the Atlas of Forensic Pathology that I mentioned in prior in a prior episode. This is not a textbook. Um, it, it might be useful in an introduction to psychology or abnormal psychology or something like that. But it's a very easy read, and it gives a very good explanation of how the different parts of the brain uh, affect empathy and how those parts of the brain interact with one another, right? Because sometimes um, one part will not work very well and the other part uh, will in some ways uh, make up for that. And there is thus this like very broad spectrum of empathy, um, uh, you know, which leads obviously to a spectrum of what we might call evil. And, you know, you do see... Uh, sociopathy and and psychopathy falling on this spectrum, uh, but also sort of more mundane issues uh, and and more even more extreme issues and more specific issues like borderline personality disorder. So I highly suggest this book. It's called The Science of Evil on Empathy and the Origins of Cruelty. It's by Simon Baron Cohen, and there will be a link in the show notes uh, to uh, where you can buy it on uh, Amazon in either, well, I have it in paperback form, paperback form, or uh, hopefully they have it in Kindle form. And, and, you know, I'll also include a link to the iBook store if I can find that. And those, just f- as a brief aside, uh, those will be, whenever I link to a product from, from this point on, uh, they're going to be affiliate links, which kick back like 10 cents on the dollar to me. Uh, they don't change the price for you in any way. You don't pay any more. Um, it just is a sort of a very, very subtle, very easy, no-cost way for you to support the show uh, by following those links. So I hope that you will do that. This episode's cold case is Gabriela Gabby Gonzalez. New leads have brought the FBI to revisit one of the most pressing cold cases in Chula Vista, the 2002 disappearance of 14-year-old Gabby Gonzalez. For a long time, detectives have believed that Gabby's body could be buried in the Otay River bottom. Today, the FBI and several different law enforcement agencies have joined forces and are thoroughly searching the area after they got new evidence that pointed them in this direction. They can't tell us what that evidence is, but do say they are confident they have the right location. Gabby went missing on April 5th of 2002 when she was just 14 years old. She left a note for her mom saying she was going out and she was never heard from or seen again. We're hopeful that new leads will bring us to a resolution. We, We just want to bring Gabby home to her mother We want to solve this case, and we want to identify those people involved in her murder. What is kind of unusual with regard to most cold cases that I cover, uh, and that most other podcasts cover, is that there has been some pretty serious uh, developments in this case very recently, as you will soon see. Uh, We're going to start at the beginning. Gabriella, Gabby Gonzalez, we're going to call her Gabby from this point on, was born on September 22nd, 1987. She lived in San Diego, California, with her mother Leticia and her brother Eduardo Fernandez. Now, 
the mother is uh, her name is often listed as Leticia Gonzalez Fernandez um, or Fernandez Gonzalez. I honestly forget. I think that there is an ex-husband in, in there somewhere that is probably the father of Eduardo, uh, not the father of Gabby. Although I can't, I can't confirm that. Uh, but there is this back and forth between these two different last names. Uh, so that's just something worth pointing out. So Gabby was born on September 22nd, 1987. She was last seen on April 5th, 2002, when her mother dropped her off in Montgomery High School where she was a freshman. That day, as on the two prior days at least, she left school almost immediately and went to her boyfriend's, 19-year-old Juan Jose Vera, in Chula Vista, California. Later in April 2002, 14-year-old Gabby was reported missing, presumably by her mother. She was 5 feet 5 inches tall and weighed 115 pounds. She had black hair, black eyes, and was probably wearing Levi's jeans. She also wore glasses or contact lenses. In 2003, witness interviews and other investigative leads led detectives to classify Gabby's case as a homicide. Initially, for at least a, a little bit, it was considered a runaway. She was considered a runaway with her boyfriend. But certain information that I could not find any specifics about led police to reclassify her disappearance as a homicide. That was in 2003. In February 2003, Gabby's boyfriend, Juan Jose Vera, well, I'll just say Vera from now on, who had gang affiliation since before Gabby disappeared. He was arrested in February 2003 in relation to six bank robberies. I'm pretty sure he did not serve time for those charges. Perhaps he pled, pled out. I don't know. Uh, I couldn't find too much information about those bank robberies. Now, the San Diego Union Tribune reports, and I will include show notes, that... This was a report on June 16, 2005. A newspaper reported being told by Chula Vista Police Sergeant John Mikavania. I'm sorry if I butchered that name. Mikavania, I think. The sergeant told the newspaper that, quote, some braggarts on the street have been bragging about something a gang member might have done. The rumor we got was something bad happened to her while she was in Chula Vista. Unquote. Now, by this time, Gabby's boyfriend, Vera, is in prison for robbery and possession of meth with intent to sell. He was named a person of interest, but has never actually been charged in relation to Gabby's disappearance. June 2005, Chula Vista police searched the Ote River bottom at Ote Valley Regional Park due to suspicions based on leads that her body had been hidden there. Now, the Ote River bottom is just what it sounds like. It's a dry riverbed. A lot of brush. There's plenty of photos that you can see. I'll put photos into the uh, show notes, into the script, basically when I, when I post to the truecrimereview.net, so you can get a sense of what authorities were dealing with in looking for Gabby. So that was June 2005. We're coming all the way up to basically present day, November 10th, 2016. Nearly 50 police officers, FBI agents, district attorney's office investigators, and evidence technicians turned out to spend the day carefully searching a large patch of the rough, brushy Ote River bottom using metal detectors, ground-penetrating radar, and other technology. Teams also found out across the neighborhood around Date Street and Date Court, handing out flyers with Gonzalez's photo and asking if anyone remembered the case. So around Date Street and Date Court, these are, this is the area, the residential area, immediately around the Ote River Bottom, where, again, they suspect they will find, if they have not already, uh, Gabby's body, unfortunately. That was November 10th, 2016. November 14th, 
2016 police told reporters, We believed there was evidence to be found, so we conducted an operation last week, and the operation was a success, and now we have more information to work with. Chula Vista PD Lieutenant Fritz Reber won't say exactly what they found, but he did say that he believes her killer will soon be brought to justice. And that is all the information that I have on Gabby Gonzalez, unfortunately. It sounds to me, based on the facts, that they found her body. This is conjecture. That they found her body and that there was sufficient evidence related either to the information that led them to her body or in relation to processing her body itself for evidence to charge Juan Jose Vera. I suspect that they will charge her boyfriend with her murder in the next month or two. And he is currently, I think, still incarcerated. So I will obviously bring updates as soon as I get them. But uh, hopefully her mother, uh, her mother and her brother were present at the November search at the Ote River bottom for for Gabby's body and they were obviously and understandably very emotional here is just a few words from her mother and her brother again I really like to get the family's words about their loved one when uh, ever possible so here are a couple of quotes Gabby's mother Leticia told reporters during the November 2016 search Quote, I would like to know if she is alive. Brother Eduardo said, quote, We're always going to keep hoping until there's a body. You mourn all the time. Fox 5 San Diego also quoted him as saying, in response to the positive police reaction to the new search, Eduardo said, quote, Very fortunate they haven't forgotten about her and that there are new leads. We feel very blessed. Now, I'm not going to over-dramatize, but it really makes me sad. It breaks my heart. You know, you, you listen to a family who is actually in a predicament where they have to feel very blessed that police may find their loved one's body. So I will keep you all posted of any new developments in this case. There are threads on web sleuths and at the true crime review subreddit about gabby and the search for her and i will make sure that i update those as well with any new information okay i want to thank you for listening to episode nine of true crime review you can search itunes or go to truecrimereview.net slash subscribe to subscribe via your favorite podcast app or listening service. We are on most of them. If we are not on a particular service or app that you use and you know you know there's a way for us to get included in that directory, please don't hesitate to email podcast at truecrimereview.net and let me know. I want to say our theme music is Our Planet is Lost by Entropy Audio. And you can find more about them at entropyaudio.bandcamp.com. I just want to thank all of you for your patience. It's been weeks since my last episode. Probably should have anticipated that given the Thanksgiving holiday. I'm going to try to avoid doing that in the future. And that may happen again around Christmas slash New Year's. I'm hoping to get a few episodes ahead so I have something to put out even if I'm too busy to record on those over the the holidays. So thanks again, and please remember that families deserve the truth and victims deserve voices. This has been True Crime Review.